We are going to continue with Markets Day here with Power Forward. And we have a wonderful panel lined up. We have called it Distribution System Markets, Market Design Considerations. And we have with us today Paul Santalella, the president of Paul Santalella and Associates, LLC, Josh Wong, CEO of Opus One Solutions, and Cheryl Roberto, uh, who's a partner with uh, Partner Utility Transformation and Regulation with TFC Utilities. We must point out that Paul and Cheryl are Commissioner Emeriti here at the PUCO, so um, they feel our pain up here so we're very grateful for their part we're very grateful for their participation and Steve Lesser is also in the crowd so we could do like a you know 2010 quorum like 2009 quorum if you wanted to relive it and uh, and we'll make sure to provide that picture up when this is all said and done no but seriously thank you very much for your participation today um, we very much view um, the three of you and then Paul and Cheryl very much view you as important minds uh, for the state of Ohio so we're very grateful for your participation Paul you're up first well thank you chairman commissioners distinguished staff uh, you know we're it's a pleasure to be back here and among friends and colleagues again um, I want to do a few things today. Uh, one is, you know, we've heard a lot of, about this jog, walk, run. I think that's valuable, but only if you have some idea of what direction you're moving in. So I want to start by giving you some fundamentals that will help you shape and consider where you, where you ought to be going as you think about these questions of market design. Secondly, I want to build on and to some degree distinguish some concepts around platform, uh, building on what Jedi Taft has talked about in the past, and uh, landing at the view of an economist, which looks at platforms and platform markets in a very distinct way and has some, you know, some very important characteristics to it. And finally, I want to end with some practical considerations as you figure out how to move into this design phase going forward and what that might mean. So if I can start, I want to, yeah, I want to begin with what I've called some fundamental truths. First of all, sorry to say we didn't resolve everything when we were, we were in your shoes. You have some hard challenges coming. Uh, you know, the remaining affordable while sales are not largely growing and the revenue model is, you know, that historically utilities benefited from has largely disappeared. Addressing new threats to reliability, security, resilience, and potentially the, you know, depending on where policy ends up, the, maybe the hardest challenge is how to remain environmentally sustainable if you end up having to decarbonize and at the same time electrify much of what is otherwise fossil fuel infrastructure. So hard problems. You need to figure out how to be most efficient in addressing these problems, and that's where markets come and play a role. Secondly, we're in a, role where, a world where digital technology makes a huge difference. I mean, we all know that there's more computing power there's more communications, et cetera. I think maybe something that we've missed is that it's really very inexpensive these days to put in a device the same computing power that were in early generation iPhones. So it's not just computing in the cloud, but there are actually devices that are becoming increasingly smart. And so what you have now is the emergence of these distributed and increasingly autonomous devices and systems. So, you know, this includes, you know, what we are calling the Internet of Things, but is really a set of devices that can smartly interact with whatever signals they can access and receive. We're looking at electric vehicles, which in a few select cases are price competitive with internal combustion engines today, but the projections are that early to mid next decade, we will see electric vehicles that are first cost price competitive with internal combustion engines as we move batteries and vehicle electric vehicle manufacturing to scale. And we have very rapid, very efficient solid state power electronics coming onto the grid. We have all the distributed energy resources you've been, been hearing about. And this brings us now to the role of markets because all of these devices can respond to market price signals 
and they can respond to market price signals even though having hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles, millions of smart devices, is going to create a computational problem that makes centralized dispatch of all of these devices computationally intractable. So you have to think about markets in this context of the world that we're entering into. Markets play a couple of important roles. One is, if you have a market that is reasonably competitive and efficient, you get prices that equal marginal cost, or put differently, that equal the value of the next best use of scarce resources that are participating in that market. So that's where you capture efficiency from having markets that you don't capture when you make an administrative decision about how much you're going to pay something. Secondly, you're doing this in a way that doesn't require centralized control or centralization of information, and that's the other big advantage that markets give you. Now, if I can move on to the question of, of platforms. You know, I think it's useful to think about what are the functions that we have in a modern grid. And I think it, I find it useful to break it down into four functions. One is you have the physical assets. These are the, both the distribution and the networking assets. These are largely natural monopoly functions because you're not going to build multiple sets of wires you know, out, to, out to customers. Secondly, you have some system planning and operational functions. These are also at least in large part natural monopoly functions because you will continue to have some dispatch of the system, some control over topology of the system, and that will in turn affect both planning and it will affect operations, both planning long term, but also short term planning and real time operations. Those things are kind of core things that we have historically thought of as the utility function. But then there, and they are also the physical platform, and the platform that most people have talked about through the first phases of Power Forward. But I want to suggest to you that there is a different kind of platform, and a very important platform as we think about this in terms of market design. And these are platform markets. And I think uh, there are two types, and we talked about this in a report that we did for New York Rev a couple of years ago, and there's references to that at the end of the slide deck. But there are two kinds that are particularly important. One is the transactional market. This includes both a forward market and it includes a real-time market based on actual demand, actual supply, actual power flows that can go down to whatever level your analysis suggests is important to have it go down within the distribution grid and provide time, location, product-specific valuation and pricing to the extent that you find that there are sufficient price differentials to justify that at different levels of depths within the distribution grid. On top of that, and in part incented by the differentials created in that transactional market, you can also have a services platform. And I'll talk and give you some examples of what each of these look like. So if I look now at this from an economist perspective, what do I mean by a platform market? A platform market is the infrastructure of a business ecosystem that matches producers and consumers, matches parties on multiple sides of a market. It provides the key components and the rules that are designed to facilitate matches and transactions. It provides easy access to goods and services for buyers, and it reduces the transaction costs associated with assembling the packages of services and products that consumers want. I've shown you on the slide three different sources, one of which is our report there in the middle, two others that discuss from the standpoint of economists who, you know, in some cases are colleagues or friends who talk about, you know, what a platform really does. Now, a platform market gives you some distinct advantages relative to a traditional line of business market. So, you can see in the middle there the blue set of lines. This is the way a traditional business operates. You heard a little of that in the last session where you had a marketer saying, well, we are building CHP. I mean, that's a, a traditional line of business product. We're going to put that out in the marketplace. The platform is different in that it is connecting and curating options, matching them to consumers, enabling trade from multiple parties to multiple customers that have different personalized needs. When you create that platform, you do three important things. One is 
you create some positive network externalities. That is to say, once you have a platform that a lot of people are on, you then will attract more people to that platform because it becomes the place where people want to transact. Secondly, you create some accelerated learning. If you think about why does Amazon work as a platform, it works not because it just has your data about your past purchases, but it has data from purchases by a lot of people like you. It can run analytics on that database, and it can provide you suggestions that someone who just had your data or just had the data for a small sample of customers wouldn't be able to provide. So you get learning. And finally, you get innovation not just from one company, but innovation across a set of suppliers who are now providing apps like the app on your iPhone or your Android phone that can do multiple things for you. So those are the things that platforms give you. You know, how do we begin to then think about what makes a platform and what makes a platform work? In general and in different proportions and relationships, there are three basic things. One is there is infrastructure. Now this is software and the kinds of things that you think about traditionally in a digital platform. Not necessarily hardware. I don't even know whether Airbnb owns the hardware servers on which their software runs. But it, you know, it, is, it is software. It is governance procedures. And it is rules that govern who gets to participate, how they participate, and, you know, and how those transactions are facilitated. That's the infrastructure. Secondly, there is data and stewardship of that data that a way, in a way that allows options to be curated for individual customers and that allows value to be created for participants within the, ne in the network. And finally, there is a community or network. And what platforms are really good at is cultivating participation within their network so that people can find valued trading partners that they want to transact with over the platform. So, if we think about some examples. A classic example is RTO Energy Markets are a transactional platform for supply in the wholesale market. They're not the only transactional platform. You can go to you know, the nodal exchange or other power exchanges and get forward contracts as well, but they're an important transactional platform. And then there are a whole range of companies that provide services on a platform. And if you look at how this has exploded over just the last few years, what you saw in 2017 is six of the 10 most valuable companies in the world were platform companies that were basically in the business of making connections between suppliers and consumers in one way or the other. So, uh, so that's, that's what a platform is. Let me now try to take this into the energy sector. So first of all, if we think about the transactional platform. What we you know, wrote about for New York Rev was we wrote about a transactional platform that essentially had two components. A forward or ex ante component. This is a, it would be, could be a continuous bilateral financial market that allows people to hedge risk. It allows people to, to decide to enter into a forward contract on a same day or day ahead basis when they set their operational schedules so that they know what it will actually cost them to use energy in their operations. It's also potentially a way in which the distribution operator can buy an option contract for a non-wires alternative that says, I will pay, I will guarantee you this much up front in return for the ability to call on you to meet a distribution need when and if it arises. Now that doesn't preclude the DER that gets that option contract from also participating in other markets, but they have to be able to commit to meet that option need, to meet the, the needs of the distribution service. There is then also, however, very importantly, a real-time or balancing market that, like the real-time market in the RTO, settles after the fact based on actual power flows, actual demand and supply. It becomes a way of, you know, of either rewarding or, you know, or, or settling with a DER that doesn't quite you know, match its, its forward contracted output, and it becomes potentially a way of creating variable distribution rates that reflect the actual delivered cost of delivering energy to different points within the distribution grid. Does this matter? Well, let me start first of all, and I'll just 
say this, uh, you know, uh, and you know, it's something we'll talk about later more, and something you'll want to investigate. At the at the level of the bulk power system, there today, you know, we we have in every RTO we settle on an hourly and and uh, and zonal basis rather than an interval and nodal basis. At some points, that can make a difference. In 2016, when we had very high demand, we had zones within PJM where there's more than a thousand dollar a megawatt hour difference in in hourly average LMPs within the zone. In fact, in AEP, although I don't know what part of AEP, it was actually much higher than that in 2016. 2017, we had lower demand levels. We didn't see that same dif uh, differential. This is something you'll want to look at under a variety of scenarios. But even when we go down into the distribution system, we can then begin to talk about where does distribution locational pricing make sense? Well, I want to start by connecting the wholesale market to the retail market and, you know, and talking a little bit about, you know, what you heard yesterday in terms of stacked benefits. Because I think it's important to think about the fact that these are not 40 independent things that you're always going to just be able to add up. You know, the reality is that there are three basic kinds of electrical products in an AC grid. There's real power, there's reactive power, that is what provides the voltage that allows the power to flow through the line, and there are various kinds of reserves. And in general, any given unit of capacity can only be providing one of those at a time. Now, if you're providing real power, it may have different values associated with it. You may be deferring a, 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 an investment in distribution as well as providing mark, uh, uh, power into the wholesale market. But that is all that you're doing, and you're not also at the same time using that same capacity and holding it in reserve in case it's necessary. You can't do both. So, you know, so it's important to understand that. If we take this and take it down into the distribution system, it may or may not matter depending upon your specific system and, you know, and what's going on in terms of distribution, but it can matter. So here is an illustrative analysis that we did for our New York report. And what you see is that if you, in fact, had on this circuit, which was sort of a commercial residential circuit in upstate New York, uh, if you had on a peak day DLMPs, distribution level LMPs, down to the customer level, as opposed to looking at what the LMP was at the substation, you could have potentially reduced total customer cost by 5%, including 4% reductions for people who didn't change their behavior at all. You would have made it much cheaper to charge electric vehicles. You could have saved 12% in commercial buildings that could shift their loads. And you would have added revenue from reactive power to people who actually had PV on the system. So are there su situations where going down to LMPs in a distribution market can matter? Yes, there are. This is something that going forward you would want to analyze. So. Let's now turn to the other kind of platform, the services platform. So one way to think about this as an initial thing is to think about online marketplaces. Uh, you know, since I did this report in, you know, last year, we actually now have AP and First Energy who have both adopted online marketplaces. Some of these are very detailed. Some of them are actually providing home maintenance services as well as products, and you can envision how they might play out. But let me give you an example of a marketplace that is a little different. It's a mobility marketplace that is beginning to emerge with the capabilities to do a lot of different things to give you an example of where a services platform might go. So this is, a, is something that was, has been put together by Energy, a German utility, and is being rolled out, at least in part, in, in California and the United States as part of an oxygen initiative. So they put together a series of applications, a demand clearinghouse that was based upon what prices were in the wholesale energy market, a uniform payment system for charging regarding of where, where you charge for tolls for parking, a car sharing app, and even an application that would allow someone to swipe you know, a, a device by your car, open your trunk and deposit a package that you had approved to be pre-positioned pre in your car without you having to leave your office. They have now positioned this as things that will eventually go on a transactional platform for mobility, a platform that will provide optimization of power system and fleet optimization, a whole set of vehicle services, including insurance, 
and software updates and maintenance for OEMs and for, for owners that will provide infrastructure services, that will provide user and vehicle identity, and ultimately connect a whole range of providers on multiple sides of that platform with the ultimate objective of being able to optimize and manage fleets of autonomous vehicles that are both shared and electric, knowing that when we get to that point, whenever it comes, the cost per vehicle mile traveled will, will be potentially as little as a, a fourth to 10% uh, of what it costs you to own and operate your own car, which sits in a garage 95% of the time. So they are looking forward and figuring out how they're going to play in this marketplace. I want to turn to some of the questions that you've been, been asking about. And one is, you know, what are the kinds of considerations that affect the utilities role? And I think there are three points that are important here. One is that defaults matter. And so long as the default service option is a simple flat commodity rate, you're much less likely to get the robust services uh, that you have talked about wanting to have in the retail space. Because A, people tend to stick with whatever the default is, and B, the default sets the frame against which people compare what other kinds of services are available. Secondly, I think there is a rule for utility adjacent, what I call adjacent services, or what in New York they call platform revenue opportunities. And I think this happens in three or four very specific kinds of cases. It happens you know, when you've got something that is coordinated with grid operations. So premium reliability service might be an, uh, 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 a way of thinking about that. It happens when there is a custodial data stewardship that creates a service that might be a data analytics service that no one else is really well positioned to provide. It happens when there's a public service obligation, such as service to low-income customers. And there may be other examples not of scale economies, but real scope economies, where there are things that the utility naturally does as part of its utility service that it can leverage to do something else that is not already going on in the marketplace. And you ought to be paying attention to that, deciding on policy on that, deciding how you want to share or incent or whatever you want to do to ensure those things that wouldn't otherwise happen, happen and happen efficiently. The other area that I think is Im really important to understand are the information flows necessary to make you know, the, the transactional and the services markets work. And in particular, I think there are a couple of areas to pay attention to. One is there will be certain operational and planning information that you may not want to just make publicly available because it has critical information uh, protection implications or has o other operational implications. And you have to decide what's the role of the utility versus third parties in that space. The other is with respect to customer information. You know, and as I said, there are going to be some value streams that depend on analytics with respect to an aggregation of customers and not just an individual customer. And there may be things that the utility is positioned to do there that a, an individual retailer may not be. And you have to think about how to do that. So, Briefly, what are the value uh, opportunities for consumers in this? One is improved asset utilization and improved control through flexible demand and control of smart devices. This could significantly reduce costs going forward because we now have asset utilization in this industry that is 50% or lower compared to 75% or higher in virtually every other capital intensive industry in, in our economy. So if we can get the demand side engaged, that's a significant uh, benefit. Secondly is electric vehicles. You know, if we get to the point where we have five or 10 minute charging, you know, five minute charge of an electric vehicle, that's a megawatt or more of demand at a particular location and we need to be prepared to manage that. Uh, but ideally we would manage all this smartly so that it would help us flatten loads rather than create problems. Third is, is in terms of distributed energy resources, you actually want to value them based upon the services that they actually are able to provide and that's what a market will do for you. Finally is in terms of, of reactive power, you know, one of the things that is, it's almost a no-brainer is that we ought to be 
pushing voltage down into the bottom quartile of the vol uh, available ANSI voltage range because that savings, it's, it comes at one to two cents a kilowatt hour, and we ought to be specifying that as a target. We ought to be rewarding DER when it helps with that target, and we have to decide what to do when DER either creates you know, in, in increased energy costs because it pushes voltage up or creates additional costs in terms of equipment because it requires equipment to cycle more often. We need to decide what to do with that, but you need to start by having a standard of where you want to go to get maximum efficiency out of the distribution grid. Finally, let me leave you with just a, a couple of, of things to consider. There are some things that I think are foundational as you move towards market design. One is you need to complete a deployment of either interval or advanced meters so that you can actually measure what people use where and when. Secondly, you need to pay attention to what's going on in terms of the settlement practices. You know, we have in Ohio still, we're still settling even where we have advanced meters based on customer class load duration curves. What that means is that no retail supplier has any incentive whatsoever to move demand towards lower price periods. And that's something that you do control yourselves and you ought to be trying to change. Third is, that, you know, is working with PJM on trying to decide, you know, can we go to nodal and interval settlements? You also ought to think about being involved in the, the current summer only demand response senior task force where they're looking at the question of, uh, or at least have, the, have the, the, the scope that they could look at the question of how price response ought to play in the capacity market, and, uh, and you ought to be looking at where you, where you want to go on DLMP markets. Finally, you ought to be implementing integrated volt bar control to get those energy savings and to establish a standard against which you would begin to develop markets in reactive power. Then there are a whole other set of other things that I've listed here that ought to be considerations that you think about as you put together a roadmap for designing markets going forward. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Josh, you're up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, staff. And uh, great to come back. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come back after Power Forward 2. It's exciting to share our thoughts and experiences. And I don't know what happened, but thank you for putting me beside two amazing Commissioner Emeritus. So uh, the bar is high. The bar is very, very high. Uh, but it's exciting to see Ohio Power Forward move uh, forward uh, from mostly data gathering to now even more so uh, rate making, uh, regulatory making, market making. It's incredible and very, very exciting. As a quick refresher, Opus One is a software engineering solutions company. Our aim is really to combine the three worlds of modern software development with power systems engineering, with power system economics. And really the objective, as, as, as Paul mentioned around walk, jog, run, is really to, to run towards really eventually a roadmap of a decentralized energy economy. So a triple uh, sustainability of environmental sustainability with decarbonization, a technical sustainability with digitization, and also an economic sustainability with what we are talking about with market design and business model design. Via a roadmap of four key elements, uh, number one starting with planning. I think planning is the first step to market making and a fundamental foundational step to market making. Number two is really around real-time DER management. Uh, number three is around what happens when we build resilience microgrids and sharing local energy supply and demand for resiliency. And last but not least, which is most core to today's topic, around transactive energy or market making elements. Um, we talk about markets, but what is the market's objective? And we believe the market's objective is to capture and exchange value. Uh, markets are not new. Uh, here we have bulk power markets uh, for a very long time, and even behind the meter, there are commercial market forces such as do we buy a battery from here or there? Do we buy a solar from here to there? But where we see the biggest missing piece now is actually the wires grid itself on a distribution system. We think that is one of the highest uh, cost elements, but also one of the highest value elements to enable um, forces, market forces to happen from both sides, the bulk power side as well as the customer side. 
Uh, Paul talked about a lot about a platform model. I fully agree with that. Uh, we firmly believe in the power of platforms. And what we need to remember is uh, the grid has always been a platform. This is not a new thing. The grid has been an electron highway, a poles and wires, uh, 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 oil and gas type of platform, uh, the electron highway, we call that grid 1.0. Then we move into grid 2.0, a data-driven platform. Uh, we used to call it smart grid and we still call it the smart grid. And that relates to what Paul talked about around planning and operations as the utility leverage the power of data, analytics, predictive analytics, AI, machine learning, etc., to better plan and also to better operate the grid. Now I think what we are moving towards is as we further empower the edge, empower the customer to become prosumers, empower customers to collaboratively work with the utilities with the grid 1.0 and 2.0 platforms, there is a way for value exchange. Certain elements may mean a net metering type of program, other may mean a feed-in tariff, others may mean a non-wire solution, demand response, energy efficiency. But in each of these constructs, we are exchanging value. And ultimately, where this needs to move towards, in the instead of programs and fixed designs, we move towards a more dynamic, granular, perhaps locational, perhaps marginal type of value transacting market platform. And we believe that is the key to unlock value that can there, thereby be stacked from behind the meter to above the meter on the distribution system to the bulk power system and, it, and vice versa, which is when we dispatch, when we control, instead of purely aggregated dispatch to take every resource no matter what time and location we have, to do granular dispatch, to do locational specific dispatch. If Paul says we're charging a megawatt <laughs> with a small block of cars, then we need to make sure we pump as much distributed generation in that area as possible because that's where the locational value of energy that's decentralized will be extremely, extremely high. So our platform in the middle allows us to do that. Now, we, we can talk about where we're running towards, but we, we do definitely appreciate that the, the roadmap today to get there is really around integrated distribution planning. And this in itself is also new. Planning is not new, but integrated planning is new. And it is the absolute first step for good market design. Now, of course, we don't have to get all the elements perfect, get an A plus in every single step of the way before we move towards a market. At the same time, these are elements we should consider as we uh, look at the entire roadmap that can move in series and in parallel at the same time. Uh, the first few elements we see is, is visibility, control, optimization, and valuation. And looking at the arrow at the bottom, these are integrated planning solutions. And this is purposefully an eye chart so that we can really pass on a few key data elements that you might need to have when you look at distribution plans around how much of the grid is visible. Well, today, not a lot. How accurate is the model? Well, today, it's in progress. How much of the grid can you control? maybe a few switches, bring on demand response, bring on automatic switching, how about generator curtailment, how about power factor? What can we optimize? Well, investments is the first thing we need to optimize, where, how, how big we place assets. Uh, and also how we operate them is also something we optimize. But guess what? Distribution systems are much harder to optimize than behind the meter or, or, or bulk power assets. It is unbalanced. It is highly unbalanced. So there are some technical challenges and breakthroughs in the optimization, optimization space that we can leverage. And when we optimize, for example, investments, do we build another wire? Do we upsize the cable? Do we underground? Do we put in parallel feeders? Or do we leverage non-wires alternatives? Or do we look at reactive power compensation to increase the effective capacity of lines. So there are many options, and it's up to optimization to develop which options are the most cost effective. I remember Chairman Hack, you said well, in a recent article, right, state commissions, commissioners are at core economic, commission, uh, economic regulators, and investment planning, given the various options that DERs can provide, and the services DERs can provide, is key to economic uh, optimization as we move ahead in this roadmap. 
Then optimization and various planning actually allows for valuation, which is key. And when we talk about locational marginal pricing, whether it's, I would say, the, 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 uh, uh, the vision and the roadmap and the capability even to demonstrate that now around location, distribution, location of marginal pricing, or some of the interim measures that we see in New York, for example, around location of LMP plus D, uh, taking wholesale market pricing and trying to assign it various distribution factors. The, the uh, process to start evaluating something and iteratively learning from that is absolutely key. It will be an iterative exercise. It will be both an art and a science at the same time. Now, valuation takes us towards b new business models, and that's when we look at markets. But markets is also one element. It is absolutely the right place to go, in our opinion. There are interim measures, however, such as non-wire solutions, such as uh, various rates and tariff design, such as uh, various program design. But when we look at the true platform model, will be a market on the distribution side. Now we talked about the essence and importance for markets and, and also planning as the, the essential data collection, data driven elements to lead towards a market uh, that includes both technical, environmental, and economic optimization. How do we get there? What is the process to get there? What do we do with the data? So in here we mapped out a process around integrated planning to support the evolution of platform models and broader public, public policy goals, which are your objectives. So we, without going box by box, but we collect data such as, what are we trying to plan for? Is it electric vehicle charging? Is it increasing distributed resource penetration? Is it optimizing infrastructure investments with non-wire solutions? Each of these represent an objective, but also a various use case that we can all co-optimize. Take in forecasting, take in the utility uh, distribution of wires models, take in new plans around asset automation, such as uh, battery storage, such as uh, Volvo optimization, and take in new rates and market structures. Then techno and economic optimization. Stay true to allowing the network itself to expose value around power flow and optimization. And that brings the valuation and the nodal valuation or locational valuation of distributed resources. And that's the key because in this space, it is not a, it, it is a constrained market, meaning that you don't have free electron flow everywhere you go. A lot of the values of the system is ba built similar to the LMP market and the wholesale side on constraints around the wires itself. And that affects how free and freely flowing, how liquid as well your market becomes. So the constraints and opportunities on the grid itself often defines the value of electrons and not just where it comes from and how it's generated. So the, the grid has a huge role to play in it. And then evaluating various options, you always need various options, feasibility and et cetera. And what this process will lead to is really, number one, what is the business value of an investment, of an asset? Why solar, why storage, why a wire, and when and how? Uh, advising on short-term and long-term grid planning. Advising on DER programs. And finally, advising on market design. And that ties to, for example, the broader, broader public po policy goals, such as Ohio's plans to do electric vehicles, such as the need to enable behind the meter generation as well as prosumer policies. Now, I think taking a step back as well, why would we call integrated? What are we integrating? Why, why is integrated planning new? Well, planning is not new. We have been doing that for decades and decades and decades from slide rules to now computer automated systems. But what are we integrating? We're essentially integrating grid planning with DER planning, above the meter and behind the meter. Bulk power generation with behind the meter generation. That is a holistic system. That's why it's integrated. Uh, wires and non-wire solutions. The other, uh, the other perspective of integration is really around the, the traditional siloed functions of a utility from a planning siloed function to an operational silo function, to a markets and rates silo function. These traditionally all different departments and different functions. But when we explore, for example, the dy dynamic nature of DERs, how does solar variability affect your capital investments plans? Now you start bringing operations into planning. Now you start needing to do stochastics, time series, probabilistic based planning. 
bringing the market signals and the value of DERs as non-wire solutions into capital investments. Now you just cross the lines between market rate making as well as planning. So we see a greater integration both vertically from bulk to distribution to behind the meter and horizontally from long-term planning, short-term planning, operational planning, real-time operations, and the parallel market forces that happen. And that's the process that we see uh, paving the roadmap for market design. Now, value is the absolute missing element, and I know there has been lots of discussion, so we don't need to go there around value stacking and defining the, the intricacies on how value is calculated. But to, to emphasize on how value is used, not just calculated, is really because the business models around DERs are getting very complicated. In the past, a few parties own uh, generation. The grid is owned and, own and operated by one party, and customers simply just consume electricity. Now, with distributed energy resources, the who owns it, who operates, span a spectrum and an array of business models whether it's utilities owned and operated, whether it's aggregator operated, whether it's customer sided assets, but pass it on to a developer to operate or utility to have operating rights. Each of these lay out a specific business model that can be its own program, which has historically happened. But now how do we finally unify these various programs into one? And the answer lies in value, and value naturally leads in market design. And the value-based uh, system markets is, is not new. Tra transactive energy has been discussed, I would say, for, for over 10 years. And it has always been seen, and I always like to quote the transactive energy framework from the Gridwise Architecture Council, which is really the, the end state of where many believe the grid will become, from a, an instrumented grid with relays to an intelligent grid, with an automated grid to really a transactive grid. Um, so that is using the value to control the grid and balance the grid is always seen as the, techni the techno-economic optimal state of uh, grid evolution. And our reference project is the one uh, we are actually deploying in New York under New York Rev with National Grid. This is where we are actually taking uh, work partnering with National Grid as they call the distributed system platform. Uh, the platform operator, and uh, Opus One as the distributed system platform provider, the solution to enable the market, and to involve a large prosumer, the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, around 30 megawatts or so of generation, where we are actually bringing down New York ISO zonal pricing, uh, taking into account national grids, uh, real-time power flow and forecasters, so forward-looking market, as well as real-time same-day market, taking into account their assets uh, and line constraints and opportunities, volver optimization, et cetera, and coming out with a price based on LMP plus D pricing. We pass that price to the DER, there may be some negotiation. The DERs respond to the pricing through a responsive web application. The pricing is cleared and the DERs are dispatched. It is a uh, clean, fairly end-to-end -end demonstration of what a distribution level marketplace may look like. Now, this is still in de deployment right now, so we, the market is expected to go live shortly. And happy to uh, uh, share results when it's public with the PSC there. So taking a step back, I think what this ultimately r results in is, is revolutionize, revolutionizing the utility customer relationship. On the left-hand side, we see the traditional utility functions. By improving visibility, control, and optimization, we enable valuation. We can't evaluate something without knowing what's happening with the grid. So these are essential steps. Exposing value to the customer allow new b platform business models. Giving the customers a business model to work with allows cus for customer engagement. And as if the customer is engaged, they can respond and operate in a way that is actually grid value adding to the rest of the ecosystem. And when you add value back to the ecosystem, to the platform, you optimize grid investments and operations, and it creates a double helix of a positive feedback loop. It is the goal, of course, there's a roadmap to get there. And we are doing it now. 
And when we talk about market design considerations, these are just some standard market design considerations. No need to get into every one of them, but really access diversity, how it's how people are contributing value, efficiency of the grid, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of questions, but the, the, the pathway is fairly clear. And it all starts with planning. Uh, market design begins with integrated planning. And as such, we can enable a future-proof market to happen that aligns with Ohio's strategic vision, enabling policy priorities such as non-wire solutions, valuation of DERs, hosting capacity as an access, rate and tariff design, EV planning, et cetera, and thereby increase and improve customer priorities and supporting customer choice. And we believe this function is absolutely essential and should be happening right now as a part of a utility planning cycle. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Cheryl? It's a delight to be here this afternoon, and I'm going to just jump right in because this is an exciting uh, conversation. Uh, so Paul and Joshua have given you a great picture of the end state, of the, uh, the energy service ecosystem of the future, what that could look like uh, using markets, whether that's a, a transactive platform, probably further into the future than what we can wrap our heads around right now, or some of the platform markets that Paul talked about. So just to give you a little context for where I'll be going, I'm going to go a little more near term, but it will be a, a first step along that pathway. Um, so it all fits together, and I think it, 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 we didn't even talk to each other that much before we started, but it absolutely fits together. Um, <clears throat> this is us. We'll talk about that later if you want to. If you think about a market, a market is, in fact, some place where something is offered that someone wants to buy. So let's just start there. What do we know about what consumers want? We've heard it all week. I have been present even though I haven't been physically present. I've been listening. You have heard any number of times that we don't have homogenous consumers. We have consumers who have very different needs and desires. And this is a bit of data that's out there about what those consumers, how they can be classified. And it's not millennials against baby boomers or rural against urban. They actually do have uh, all of us fit inside of those categories despite where we live or what our age might be. But there are some similarities. We see that most customers are actually interested in things like smart appliances. We actually know now that some consumers are willing to pay more for enhanced services. And this is kind of new because we're used to thinking that all customers want the absolute lowest cost for their energy. And what we can see, if you look at these last two columns, is that somewhere in the order of about 40% of customers would pay more if they could for enhanced services, whether those are around green services or reliability. But it just it tells us these are not single-minded customers, and, and they will respond to markets that give them opportunities to choose other products and services. So customers on their own are acquiring energy management devices in growing and growing proportions. They're finding solar that's more affordable, some jurisdictions more affordable than others, but it is falling fast, falling faster than any projection comes up with. Every single year a new projection comes up and it's lower than the year before. Same thing on storage. It's becoming a more and more attractive option. Which brings us to what it is that this, this platform might be. Where does the utility fit in with this market? Markets are working pretty well on their own, but where does the utility fit in? And we now have some data that suggests that most consumers want to rely on their utility for information about energy services. It's overwhelming the number of choices that are out there where they would like to have a trusted energy provider tell them something that is useful. So, Looking at that number, 74% of the customers that are out there would like to rely on their utility to help them navigate all these choices. But they don't actually review, consider their utilities as to be the best innovators that are out there. And I'll say that's for customer-facing applications. Um, I'm a utility fan. You guys know before I was a commissioner, I actually ran utilities. I think utilities do a lot of good work. I think they can be incredibly innovative when it comes to optimizing the grid itself. When it comes to customer-facing market, market products, I think that we need to look at the, the free market to do that. Um, 
but customers will rely on their utilities in making choices in that market, though. A, a utility can play a huge role in making customers feel comfortable about adoption of some of these uh, distributed energy resource uh, solutions that are provided. Um, customers do want help, but they want to maintain control. So if you think in terms of uh, a, a platform in which a utility uh, customer could approach the utility or a platform provider, and that platform aggregates data about how the, how the consumer uses energy, um, maybe what their rooftop has, are there trees around it, how big is their house, how old is their house, um, what neighborhood do they live in, aggregate all that information, both the information that's available to the utility directly and information that can be available publicly. They can crunch, crunch all that information and match solutions to that consumer that are fed by, by solutions providers. Solutions providers can say, if you've got customers who have this kind of profile, we have some interesting products and services that they would probably like. Make that match. Now what consumers tell us is that they absolutely would love to have that help and be uh, directed to uh, a contractor that's pre-approved by the energy provider. They don't want the energy provider to just match them up and send them on their way, but they would love to have that help from a qualified uh, match to a qualified product. So when, qu when consumers were asked, would you use a platform like this, where someone would take your information and combine it with commercially available products and services and help you navigate that, 49% said, absolutely, definitely, probably. And even 30%, 36%, excuse me, said, we probably would, we might, we could, maybe not. But that's a lot. And this is, this, these are numbers that are reflective of folks who haven't actually seen this kind of service yet, this kind of platform. So here's what they thought they might get from that platform. They thought they might get some insights, uh, discover opportunities that they couldn't find on their own to save money, find some products that they might not have found on their own. 53%, this is the second bar up from the bottom, felt that it was appropriate for their utility to do this for them, to provide this platform service for them. And they're willing to pay for it. Again, these are consumers that um, they're not looking for the absolute cheapest. What they're looking for is value. And that value could include a platform. And there's a whole range of, of willingness to pay. Anything from 7% who said, I don't want to pay anything for it, to 22% of consumers said they'd pay $50 or more to have access to a platform like this. These, these are really insightful because what I'd like to propose to you as a near-term first step and something that our, our company actually works to deploy is something that we call, and being regulators, you'll appreciate just how wonky this is, a million rate-based program. So the idea is that the utility becomes responsible for providing that platform, using its data, gathering other data, facilitating matches with third party, well, I won't use third party, I'm sorry, I did hear that. How about distributed energy resource solutions providers? Matching that you like that. <laughs> so finding those services that are commercially out there already and matching them up with customers who are interested in, in having that match made. Now, the customer has some barriers to adoption. Some of it is they can't find these products and services on their own. So the utility can overcome that barrier by providing the match from them. Some of it is they don't have the upfront cost of the capital, and that's where the million rate base idea comes in. Instead of having a generalized rate base, well, you're going to have that anyway for all the other parts of the utility, consider that that customer at their meter could develop their own rate base. So they can choose the products and services that they want on their energy ecosystem. They can work with this uh, this provider that is not the utility. The utility is not the provider of the service. The provider is someone outside of the utility, unaffiliated with the utility. The utility's role is to be that matchmaker, to feed this market, this transaction market, the services platform with data, but to also feed it with capital. Let that consumer choose that product or service. Maybe they flip a credit card out and pay for it. 
Maybe they put it on a home equity loan. But what if the utility said to that consumer, if you'd like to put it on your electric bill, you can go ahead and do that too. And what that would mean from a regulatory perspective is that you would have to grant the utility the ability to recover of and on that capital. Do it the same way that you would for poles and wires. Given the weighted average cost of capital, most places that's about, I don't know, I haven't checked lately here, probably 7%, something like that. Sure, that won't be perhaps the cheapest capital available to every customer, but not every customer is going to have access to capital. This could be available to every consumer, whether they are in fact a renter or they own the property. So you, you deal with that split incentives problem. Uh, it, it could be um, you know, an issue of if somebody has a home and they don't know how long they're going to be in it. The product or service they choose and put on their meter as an individualized rate base stays at their meter. So they can sell their house and the house has the benefit of the investment and it also carries that tariff forward. So just highlight, that's at a high level and I want to just put it out there for you, but I want to make sure that I lay out the principles so you see what it is I'm proposing, and then in conversation we can figure out how, whether you'd like to explore it more. But basically what it does is it does build on the strength of the utility, which is access to the low cost of capital. Still preserves the role of the utility as the universal service provider. Everybody has access to these services. Um, it recognizes that the market's going to act a lot faster to discover consumer-facing products and services than a utility can on its own. So it builds on the strength of activating the market. Because the utility is already the trusted connection to the customer, it can provide customer acquisition for these uh, and animate this, this market. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't provide any cross-subsidy. All the customers are paying their own freight. So you don't have to worry that some customers are riding on the backs of others. Uh, and it does not suppress uh, competition in any way. In fact, it grows the competition pie because uh, solutions providers can come to the platform. If they have a commercially available, legitimate service, get it on there. Let customers choose. I've heard some of the solutions providers say, if I don't have a solution that somebody wants to buy, that's on me. That's what you take advantage of when you set up a, a services platform like this. Uh, and I will just, as a highlight, these last two bullets, um, this is separate and apart from an energy efficiency program that is funded with public benefits because what I'm proposing to you is market-driven, has no incentives, no cross-subsidy. You can layer your energy efficiency program over top of this. Um, so, for instance, if you have an energy efficiency program that offers a rebate for a particular refrigerator, customer can shop for that refrigerator on their, cons on their utility platform, find a Home Depot or whoever will provide that uh, refrigerator, the incentive, the coupons right there, click, 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 deliver it to my house. That's what we would envision to animate this uh, broad and wide scale distribution of all these energy resources, whether they're energy efficiency, energy management, energy storage, energy generation. All of those markets are growing on their own, but they grow far faster if the utility serve this role as a capital provider, a data provider, a facilitator of these transactions. And why do we want them to grow faster? Because the cool stuff that Paul and Joshua are talking about only happens when you get to scale, when you actually get the data, when you have enough consumers who have the opportunity to respond to these price signals and they have the, price, the, the devices in their homes so that you can see this optimization of an ecosystem. Um, and, and finally, it also provides a vehicle to, to deploy the kinds of non-wire solutions you're talking about. So back to my days as a commissioner, I recall we got a report every year, uh, I can't remember, was it the 10% worst performing circuits for utility, something like that. What if you took that report and you figured out what would it cost to fix that circuit? And then you said, hmm, Instead of spending this money on this circuit in this way, why don't we give it some defined period of time and put it into that marketplace? That if you're on this circuit and you would like to invest in energy efficiency or some solar or a battery, something that would solve that problem, put some coupons out there. I mean, you can use this as a vehicle to drive investment where you want it to be as well. But start out easy. Start out with 
just a shopping place, a shopping place that doesn't shift burden, just gives customers more opportunities. Okay, finally, the highlights. This is completely voluntary. Doesn't have all the evaluation measurement and valuation that wears down, sinks us in those EE programs that I, I love, but I know they can be administrative burdens. There's no cost effectiveness test. This is what a consumer wants to buy. If they think it's worth something, it's worth something. Let them buy it. There's no financial scoring. If they have paid their bill for the last 12 months, they're a good customer. And it uses the tools of the market to inform customers about what they might like. So imagine that uh, I got, uh, I'm a customer, I go to this platform, I find uh, an energy weatherization provider who comes to my house, um, does the once over, figures out that I could get some insulation, maybe some new hot water tank. I can go on to this platform and say, I love these guys, four stars. When they came to my house, they showed up on time, they wore those little booties, they didn't leave a mess, and by the way, I'm saving money. Or, these guys stink. And that's where you get the feedback on the market. Um, again, the data sharing, this is big. It has to be within the bounds of, proper, of privacy, but not only consumer data has to be shared where we can do it, but utility data so that solutions providers can figure out, oh, there's, there's an opportunity out on the system. I can offer some value. Um, the obligation stays with the meter. The product and service belongs to the meter. So after the customer pays this tariff that's on their meter and their meter alone, once that is depreciated and off, it's theirs. It stays there. It's no longer on the utilities books. Um, and this operates independent of all rate design issues. You can still do all the solutions around rate design that you want. I want to point out this AC uh, E white paper says that frictionless finance is, in fact, the lubricant of these markets. Um, even folks who can afford to pay for this, um, they're, they're not going to if, it, if it's a hassle, if they have to go to their bank, if they have to have somebody come by and do an inspection of their house. Having a simple one-step process to get goods and services in their homes that meet their energy needs is uh, what consumers want and what utilities could provide in this brave new world. This is a quick sheet that I put up there. You all know the market and adoption barriers for energy efficiency and distributed energy resources in general. This knocks, knocks most of them out of the way. So it will, in fact, help bring to, this, to scale the cost-effective, commercially available distributed energy resource solutions that are out there. So let the market operate by empowering the utilities to serve this role as a matchmaker. Um, and because I have like three minutes before my 20 minutes is up, I'm gonna just throw the other piece in. This only works if you have expectations around a utility to do some new things they've never done before. So what I would propose to you that as you're thinking this through, think in terms of your role is to figure out is the service provided by the utility adequate? Is this adequate service? And I will suggest to you that 10 years ago, I was a new commissioner sitting in your shoes. 10 years from now, it's going to be an entirely different world from what I saw even 10 years ago. It's entirely different now. I would propose to you that you think about what would adequate service be for a utility in 10 years and work backwards. And I'll, as you know, have an answer for you. I think that a utility's role, adequate service in 10 years out should look something like they're still responsible for safety, reliability, resiliency, and security. They have to be. But on top of that, I think they have to be responsible for optimizing all energy resources, whether they're on the traditional grid or whether they're out in this ecosystem. I've heard, uh, I've heard folks this week refer to perhaps the, the distribution system's role as traffic cop. I think that's a little too binary. It's not stop go. Um, uh, an engineer that I think the world of who's doing some of the best work out there about what distribution systems can do describes it as more like an air traffic controller. And I think that's getting closer. But I would go so far as to say that the distribution utility's role is more like a symphony conductor. When the conductor gets it right, the music comes together, and it's the best thing you've ever heard. 
if the distribution utility brings together all the resources and gets it right, it will be the most economically efficient, universally available, clean energy system that we could possibly have. So to get there, I suggest to you that the utility's role has to be this symphony conductor on the grid required not, not to tolerate these resources, but to embrace and optimize them as one role. And the other role, equal, equal importance, is the responsibility to be that trusted energy provider um, creating this platform, matching solutions providers with customers, feeding that match with data information and capital. That's what I got for you. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful panel. Cheryl, let me just start with you. So this morning we got into a, a conversation about really roles and responsibilities. And, and I thought that the second panel where we had um, two very good um, uh, uh, discussants associated with that from the retail community, uh, where, where do they fit in in this in in this paradigm, I is it, do I have to turn this on? Is it on? Okay. So I I would suggest that any one of those providers should be part of this ecosystem. They they should, if they would like to, avail themselves of being a participant in this platform so that their products and services can be available for customers to, to match. Um, if a provider knows that this platform is available, they may actually design products and services around it, um, knowing that they could have the capital cost as an option covered on the utility bill. It doesn't have to be. They could still, again, sell their products and services outright or in some other means. Um, but the point would be to bring together as many of those vendors and solutions providers who would be willing to um, to be on a curated platform, uh, it can't be overwhelming to the consumer, and that's where the data and the algorithms come in, um, so that it's the responsibility of the utility to help customers find what it is they're looking for. And Paul, would you, would you classify what Cheryl's described as an adjacent service? Yes, yeah, so I, I think what, what Cheryl's described in her million rate bases is, is a little different, not very different, from something that, I don't know, Beth may remember from when I was on the commission and we, we looked at on-bill repayment. Uh, now, there we were not dealing with the utility as being the source of capital. We were saying that the capital source could be any source, and you know, but the repayment would occur on the utility bill, and that the fact that people pay their utility bills before they pay their credit card or something else would provide the greater surety that could bring down the cost of capital for permanent investments that would occur in a home. And so, you know, this might be a service that could be, you know, that, that sort of facilitation of capital and billing, you know, could be the, the kind of adjacent service that a utility might provide in the, you know, in the model that I talked about. And they might also, for example, be providing some information on credit quality because they'll have some information about unique payment histories on utility bills that may be different from payment histories on, for other things. How would you compensate for the adjacent service? So I think this is this is a you too to answer that question as well. Sorry, I, I both of you. So I I think this is a, this is a really interesting question and and not one that that we necessarily have a a straightforward answer for. So if you if you look at what New York has said with respect to platform services, they've said you know we'll allow the utility bill to you know to bear a certain amount i think it was like 80% of the the upfront cost uh, and you know but that gets paid for paid back first from the service revenue and then we'll allow some sharing on top of that if the utility puts some of its own money at risk in you know in the adjacent service but this is this is something where i think we're we're going to have to look you know, also to models from other industries, and we're going to have to figure this out. I think there's, there's not a set, you know, rule at this point about how that is, but ultimately you want to create 
you want to create a service where it doesn't exist in the market, where there, there's not a good market alternative. You want to provide some support and incentive for doing that, but you don't want to uh, you don't want to necessarily replace a service that's that's already available elsewhere in the market. I think that's the kind of tension you have to look at. Sure, if I may. So we would consider this creation of a platform in the offering of capital, the matching, that's just customer service. So it should be compensated like co customer service is today. It's a pass-through cost. You know, you do it well, it's an operating cost to the utility. It's not a profit center. What I expressed to you is that from a regulatory perspective, if we were to own and operate a utility and do this in Ohio, we would ask you to allow us to earn on the capital that we would deploy through the on-bill system at the weighted average cost of capital. So in other words, if a customer chooses to acquire a refrigerator, uh, solar panels, an uh, EV charging system, energy efficiency products, services, weatherization, whatever it is that they choose to, uh, to deploy in their own homes, if they choose to put it on their bill, then the utility earns on that in the same way it earns when it builds a substation, just in smaller and smaller increments. Okay. Other questions, Dan? I, I, I'm, uh, I'm compelled to follow up a little bit on that, Cheryl and Paul. Uh, I'm, there's my second question is, Paul, what do you think of Cheryl's idea? Up or, <laughs> up or down? And then for Cheryl, the first question, the first set of questions is, who, be, who bears the risk that the uh, that that the assets are lost, or 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 that the customer defaults? Mm -hmm. Is it is it uh, is it is it a risk that the other ratepayers bear, or mm -hmm. is it or is it somehow borne in some other fashion? And then, what's the credit qualification process for it, and what's the what are the limits, or are there limits on how much can be can be essentially borrowed by the customer? And as you know, I'm sorry to be Danny Downer for you, but those are those questions kind of make me skeptical. The questions themselves. I mean, I, if there's an answer, then uh, yeah, and there that are that make sense, that'd be that's great. But it's it's uh, it, it, those questions come to mind and make me concerned about the about the proposal. Thank you, and they're great questions, and we do, in fact, have answers to them. Uh, so on the question of the performance of the asset, if the asset gets lost, if it doesn't perform, uh, we would propose that, in the first instance, that would be on the risk of our investors. And the reason we say that is because this is a new idea. Our investors. Our, uh, my company, if I were to buy, if we were to buy a utility, it would be the utility's shareholders that would bear that risk okay, so is if, our if proposal. If it's not your company, if it's if there's not a utility, if your company doesn't become a utility in Ohio doing this, but rather it's a requirement that we impose on um, the existing utilities in Ohio, then their investors would, would be on the hook then. That would be the analogy, right? It, it would be. You could handle it whichever way you would like. Here, here's what I would say to you. We feel we have full confidence that this isn't going to result in loss of assets or that we will have difficulties. And the reason we have that confidence is because this is not an entirely new idea. There are a number of programs. Um, some are called Pay As You Save. Some are Help My Home. Uh, they're operating in numerous jurisdictions, mostly with co-ops, and they have tremendous experience. Uh, customers pay their bills. They're thrilled to pay for these services. Um, they usually save money for many of these services. So they participate, um, and in the instance where they don't, our, our position is that we'll take that risk because what we think we'll do is build enough um, data that we can demonstrate to a commission that it should be treated like any other uncollectible. Every utility has uncollectibles. So we don't think these will any, be any worse than any others, but we understand from our perspective, you know, you're starting out that way. Um, so that, that would be the answer to the first question, what about the assets? Um, I'm sorry, your second question was credit quality? Credit quality okay, and, credit ca and caps on amount that uh, customers Thank could, you. could borrow. Okay, so credit quality from our perspective is if you are, if you paid your bill in the last 12 months, then you're qualified. Now, 
And are we so crazy as to say to a, an aluminum smelting company, um, yes, we'll back your combined heat and power program without some kind of deeper exam? I think we have to talk about what that looks like. Um, but for the most part, these products and services um, should be cost effective and should provide services that are valuable to customers that will be valuable to either that customer or the subsequent customer. Um, if there is a risk, could there be a risk of like a Cadillac for a low income customer? That may have to be a, a stop gap that we would have to put in place if a customer is receiving some kind of um, PIP subsidy or something, you know, there probably would be a limitation on what they could acquire. Um, but for the most part, we think that this is recognizing that the customers are not average customers and that what they're acquiring are common sense products that add value that they are willing to pay for. So uh, to answer your question, I, I think, you know, first of all, I would, would echo what Cheryl said, that there is experience with some of this and, you know, maybe not broad experience, but there are places you can look to see what kind of performance there is, and that, that's valuable. I guess in my mind, I would see the financing as, uh, the sources of financing as being competitively procured rather than coming from the utilities, uh, you know, rate base. Uh, but that's, you know, that's sort of my market preference. I think you could imagine exceptions to that rule. You know, this might be a replacement for energy efficiency rebates. Is this might be a more cost-effective way to, you know, to pursue some of this. This might be something that you do as part of a public benefits program to get, you know, efficiency in low-income house, households and things like that. You might decide to put in the utility rate base. Um, but my my overall answer was I would be I think you may be better off uh, trying to competitively procure packages of, of financing to support the you know this this overall endeavor and offloading the uncollectible risk yeah. to the to the to those to those winners. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Tom. <coughs> appreciate um, appreciate all of you. Um, you know, looking at the new platform, uh, modern grid, uh, improved customer choice, um, you know, looking at all those things, and, and uh, Cheryl, I appreciated the polls, and, uh, and uh, really you got into my, the answer to my question a little bit more. Uh, but what I was looking at is the, um, you know, how we move forward, how we, Future proof. How do we, um, how do we, um, you know, do this without breaking the bank? Is there a, you know, priority, uh, a priority uh, that you would recommend to us? Um, and uh, Josh, you might, you might respond. Yeah. Sure, ha happy to. I think consistent with with what I presented, we we believe that if there are opportunities to to uh, uh, start a market now, I think uh, there are critical steps that can make it happen. But on a broad base level, planning has to be the the first step to do so. And what we would need to expose with planning are the values in the system. So right now, I would say with a cost now, recovery. You're not just based. talking about. I mean, we're kind of planning. We're yes. kind of looking to the future, but that's not what the oh, planning you're talking utility about. Utility infrastructure system planning, similar to let's say a DRP or DSIP uh, type of filing uh, program that is integrated. So looking at when utility make investments, uh, well, how are the investments driven? Are those driven by uh, end of life? Well, 10 worst performing feeders. I used to be on the other side planning worst performing feeders and upgrading cap, <laughs> upgrading poles and wires and cables. Or should it be uh, exploring the, really exploring systemically and systematically the options around non-wire solutions, around voltage optimization, around reactive power compensation. And there are multiple venues and solutions to provide for grid grid services or grid reliability, grid resiliency, grid power quality, where should these services come from, traditional wires or other new assets? And so I would say as a part of that, not just we need to look at capacity constraints and more effective, more sophisticated forms of planning, but really around what is the role of distributed resources in that space? What is the 
uh, even planning wise, we can review the location or marginal value or locational value in general of any distributed resources. If I have an option to replace a cable versus put a put a a, a battery system or there, uh, where should I put a battery? A feeder can be quite long, a circuit can be quite long. If the constraint is here, should the battery be here, here, here? How big should the battery be? What type of real and reactive power dispatches? So these are all planning-based problems, and we can actually start exposing in a fairly transparent, methodical, robust um, fashion of these type of value metrics, given these options. I think that's, that's number one. And once we know the benefits of various options, both wires and non-wires, that we can look at, let's say, who owns a non-wire solution, who operates the non-wire solution, how, and how can they, they be compensated. And if it's compensation, program-based, tariff-based, or should it be market-based, competitive, non-competitive, etc. So if, if I can, can kind of build on that, uh, I talked in, you know, at the end of my talk with, with, you know, with four sort of areas that are starting points for, for markets. But I think it's, it's useful to bring in this planning component as well, because that's, that's the grid side you know, of grid modernization. And I, I would say a few things. One is, is let's figure out what can be done on that side that can be done you know, relatively quickly and economically. So constraints in the distribution grid are often voltage-related constraints. You know, we can do voltage control in an integrated way doesn't necessarily require a battery, but might require a set of a small set of capacitors and advanced power electronics plus some visibility to relieve that constraint and that could be much less expensive than putting a battery somewhere. So so that's 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 first. Secondly, you know, as you're thinking about where to where to, to think about distributed energy resources, I would think about it in two contexts. One is what Josh mentioned. Think about where there are places that it adds specific value because the cost of serving that either at the bulk power level or within the distribution system is higher and you can reduce some of those costs. So you should be targeting rather than just saying, well, I'm going to accept DER wherever somebody decides to put PV on a rooftop, whether it benefits the system or not, and figure out how to target. So, for example, a utility might create you know, a solar garden in a particular place where that adds value to the grid and then sell fractional ownership shares in the, you know, in the solar garden to people who want PV, and that could be, you know, a third to half the cost of somebody putting PV on their rooftop, assuming they even have a rooftop that can accommodate it. Uh, the other thing I would do, and this is something that uh, I very much wanted to see happen when I was on the commission and we never actually were able to get the utilities to do it, is to actually have them look at what's the value of uninterrupted service to different customers because that can vary substantially. It can vary by different areas of the grid and rather than just saying I want to focus on the 10 worst performing circuits, focus on where added reliability would actually provide the most value to customers because that's the point at which you really care about reliability. There will be critical facilities where it is particularly important to have that extra reliability and resilience. There will be certain types of customers that value that reliability more than others and you ought to understand that and encourage the investment where it will make the most difference in terms of customer value. But how do you know, Paul, until, until, you, until it happens, people will say whatever they'll say about what the value is and if you plan to what they say what the value is, uh, you're going to be, you're, and my, my fear is you're going to have egg on your face when you actually have events and they're upset about not having their reliable electric service. Well, how, you, how do you deal with yeah you you'll never know perfectly but you can know better than not knowing at all which is what we what kind of the position that we're in so I spent uh, Tuesday this week at a at a DOE workshop where we were looking at how do you look at the economics of widespread and long-term power outages that's a difficult question and and we don't know all of the answers but there is there is a there are a set of methodologies to try to elicit what people think, and it's going to be, the methodologies are different depending on whether you're talking to a commercial, industrial, or a residential customer, but to try to elicit some view about how they value reliability. And what we know 
you know, from the historical work that's been done, what you can see in the DOE interruption cost estimator is that there are significant differences depending upon the type of customer that you're talking about, when the outage is occurring, the duration of the outage, and you can take those kinds of factors into account when you're trying to figure out what's the appropriate baseline level of reliability for different areas of a distribution grid and something that I've always thought you know, we would benefit from knowing more about and actually creating some templates for you know, what service should look like in different parts of our distribution grid. So, so to add to that, I think, I think it's important to separate two, or there are two major buckets of, of value. Some, can, some are absolutely objective and system driven. LMPs are system driven, a distribution LMP is system driven based on the assumption of a least cost type of operating grid and maintaining service or so providing service to the customer. These are non-refutable. It's, it's what the physics of the system says and, and it's, it's clean. It's, it's very clean. Very, can be, can be scale, can be, it's very robust, repeatable, granular, transparent, etc. Then, then I think, then there are, are some of these service driven ones around more subjective, more customer specific can be above or behind a meter as well, to the point where I think when we look at a, a, the overall roadmap of a transactive energy, some of the peer-to-peer -peer discussions that's happening within this space are also subjective values in addition to reliability. Even if I have a solar, I want to sell my friend my solar to charge his or her car because we are, we are friends or because we know each other, do we want to provide a premium on top of that? So there's a customer choice and customer specific elements, subjective element to value that we would need to, I would say, over time factor into, into these market considerations. So I would just add one thing on top of that. There are utilities in Europe that actually sell premium utility service. Now, in order to be able to sell premium utility service, you have to have a baseline that understands what basic utility service is. We don't always have that because utilities have built up their systems over time, and we pay attention to the 10 worst performing circuits, but we don't necessarily say this is, this is the baseline quality that we're building the system to in different areas. If I may, Commissioner, I, I think that everything that Joshua and Paul said is, is accurate and helpful. I believe pragmatically, as regulators in a public environment, you can't get there until you have more customers participating in the energy services markets. And you really need to think about how do we get every customer to have access and value um, that they receive from participating in these energy services markets. Um, if you impose an LMP, which from an economic standpoint, I agree it makes all the sense in the world, um, or a demand chart, again, makes all the sense in the world. But if you begin imposing what are economically correct price signals in a regulatory environment where customers don't have the opportunity to respond, then you will not be successful um, from a policy standpoint. So I urge you to think in terms of how do you animate that marketplace so that all customers have universal access to it. And, and that's why I proposed what I did. But what you need to think about or what I suggested would be important to think about are what are the market barriers to customers adopting these services. And they're the same ones from energy efficiency. Do they have visibility into who provides them? Do they trust that they'll get those results and can they pay for them? Think about those barriers as you think about how do we get an ecosystem that is capable of doing all the really cool things that Joshua and Paul are talking about. Thanks. Great. Larry? Yeah, uh, just a couple questions. Um, Paul, as you talk about transactive I swear it was on when it started. <laughs> I checked it. It won't turn on now. There. Okay. Let me know if it goes back off. Are we on? No, it's off again. <laughs> there we go. How about this? Oh. <laughs> okay. Getting applause. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, send me a bill for the repairs, I guess. Um, as we talk about transactive platform analysis uh, development, uh, it begs the question of ownership. And, and Cheryl, I'll get to, to 
your suggestion about the, the, the marriage of buyer, you know, buyers and sellers. Uh, is there any reason why, with proper consumer safeguards, that platform could not be developed and owned by a non-traditional, as opposed to a, a third party, a, a non-traditional market participant so as to avoid the risks that, that Dan has alluded to? And then I guess the second question is, assuming the answer is no, just for the sake of argument, and it's utility owned, the information systems that are foundational to the operating system of a, a transactive platform may or may not be specific and peculiar to a service territory. So the question then becomes, is there a way, and Joshua, maybe uh, th this is for you primarily, is there a way to uh, develop a transactive platform that is applicable to four service territories, cooperated, and therefore we avoid the redundancy in, in uh, uh, the cost associated with the development. So, so, Cheryl, your question first, and then Josh's question second. How about that? So I, I will say that and it, you could probably work it anyway. From, a, from an economic perspective, who's going to step up and who's in a better position? Right now, you have franchised utilities that have a special relationship with the customers in their jurisdiction. Those customers already trust and have a relationship with that utility. Um, the utility has the customer information. They have the billing information. They're just in the best place to, to scale it up. Um, could a Google come in and recreate it? Uh, probably. But why, why would you do that? Think about what you want from these utilities. What is adequate service from a utility 10 years from now? Great, thank you. I, I think the transactive energy platform, and that's what we are seeing right now, this is not a, 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 a strategy and plan. These are actual projects that we have right now in our, in our pipeline, have both models. I think what what's for sure is the transactive energy platform is intimately tied to utility databases and operating systems. It is based on their lines, their highways. It is based on power flow on their grid. Hence, tying it to their distribution system models, SCADA asset investment plan, and a lot of the values flow back to utility asset investment plans. So our current, not, not our strategy, but our, our observation in the industry is for the larger utilities, it does make economic sense that they operate the market or the platform on their own grid. That being said, not everyone has the capability, innovation, resources, and IT infrastructure to do so. So for some of the munis, co-ops, uh, for some of the smaller utilities, we do foresee a, a and it's happening in some ways, uh, a, a shared platform where a larger entity above or a private entity can come and in a joint ownership or joint operating rights uh, collaborate with various wires owners or utilities to make that happen. So uh, both models are fine, really depending on the nature of that. Okay. But IT-wise, it's absolutely possible. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, John. So, uh, you know, to give you a, a, a short answer, clearly there are some information flows that flow from system operations and from knowing the actual power flows, uh, both in terms of providing some price prediction and in terms of settlement of the real-time market has to be based on the actual power flows coming from the, the, whoever is the distribution system operator. When we wrote our report for New York, where there are multiple utilities, but we thought there should be one platform, we distinguished between sponsorship or ownership that we felt could be collectively done by the utilities in New York and operation of the platform, where there would be a separate operator that would operate across all utility service territories. Uh, can, can I, I, I actually address both this question and, and one of previous Cheryl's questions as well, which is the scalability or the necessary or necessity for scale in this. Uh, personally, I don't believe it has to be at scale uh, right, away, or right away for the platform to be, to be justified. If you look at just a non-wire solution type of feeder, I think we can already identify areas where a market signal, and Paul, you did the, a bunch of those studies, a market signal on that feeder alone that is taking real time or more dynamic pricing can be more effective, efficient, and cost saving than a fixed price signal or a net metering signal. So I think it can be absolutely mm -hmm. scaled.
really wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And we are on a a negative four minute break. Is that what you said? <laughs> um, let's see. We're supposed to start at three thirty. Let's let's take. Uh, we, we will begin promptly at 345, because I usually say like five minutes, and then it's like ten minutes. But we will begin promptly at 345. Thank you.